Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. Today is Thursday, April 18th, and it is the first day of share This is your opportunity to support the worldwide outreach of KFUO. Throughout the program, throughout the day, you will hear of ways that you can partner with KFUO in order to continue and expand the proclamation of Christ for you anytime, anywhere. That proclamation of Christ for you anytime, anywhere doesn't stop during share Today and tomorrow, we have a couple of special studies lined up. Since KFUO is celebrating its 100th birthday this year, we are doing some Bible studies that involve the number 100. Today, we are studying the only chapter in the Bible that has the number 100. To get to 100 chapters in the Bible, you need to turn to the Psalter. And so today, we are looking at Psalm 100. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Andrew Belt. Pastor Belt serves at Christ Lutheran Church in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Pastor Belt, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Good to be here this morning with you. What a joy to study Psalm 100 today, the only 100, 100th chapter in the Bible. I, I looked for another one and there's just not. <laughs> So, yeah, it's going to be fun. That's right. So, Pastor Belt, uh, today as we get started with Psalm 100, uh, just to remind us some context within the Psalter. We've looked at Psalms here on Sharper Iron before, but it's been a while. Help us to, to remember what we're looking at here in the Psalter. Yeah. You know, when we read the, the Psalms, uh, we can kind of maybe think of them as just separate prayers, but these have certainly been arranged in a, a beautiful pattern uh, that really line up and tell us the story of Christ, right? So the, the 150 Psalms are broken up into five parts. Uh, five books, as they're called. Um, the Psalm not, uh, Psalm 100 that we're going to be taking a look at today falls within book four, which is Psalms 90 through 106. And uh, as, as we kind of tell the story of the Psalms, <clears throat> we meet a man named David, um, you know, and that's kind of in the Old Testament, a lot of the prophets will use David as just the, the name for the Christ, uh, especially the one who is to come. And uh, so these, the Psalms are all about Jesus. Right. He's the one praying them. We, we see that in all of his life work. Even on the cross, Jesus prays the Psalms. And I always love how, you know, I know uh, Bon Hafer, several authors, uh, my Psalm professor at, uh, at seminary would always kind of put it when we pray the Psalms, Jesus is extending to us the words to pray with him. Uh, and so these are a beautiful collection of various prayers along God's people's history. Um, as you tell the story of the Psalms, right, book one really introduces us to David, right? We, we get to meet David, his life, his, his struggles, especially in book one, uh, God's faithfulness as he calls out to him. Um, book two really establishes uh, David's reign, his, his reign as king over, his, over the people of Israel. Uh, book three then kind of has the, the waning dynasty, right? That the kingdom of David dies, uh, the earthly king is at an end. Um, you know, we would say a kind of the death of Christ. Uh, book four kind of contemplates, where do we go from here? There's, there's a cry for God's faithfulness. And that's what we're going to celebrate. Thanks be to God today in Psalm 100. And then book five really uh, kind of ratchets up the praise. That God is, his kingdom is, is on. His promises are being fulfilled. Um, everything that the Lord has said and spoken is, is coming and here. And so we rejoice with hallelujah as the psalm ends. So that's kind of, you know, brief, very brief, broad stroke of all the book of Psalms there and hitting a little bit on Psalm 100. Now, with, with Psalm 100, it's a part of Book 4, as you said. That's Psalms 90 through 106. And Psalm 100, although sometimes the Psalms maybe seem to jump around a little bit, Psalm 100 does seem to be at the end of a, a string of Psalms that do seem to go together. Talk to us a little bit how it fits there. Yeah. So Book 4 opens up with Moses, Psalm 90, right? And, and at this point, Psalm 88 and 89 are kind of like a death and a, a, a lament, a, a eulogy, we might say. And Psalm 90 is like, where do we go from here, right? The kingdom is over. It seems like God's promises are done. What do we do? There's a breach in faith. And in Israel's history, right, who was the great figure that stepped into the breach between God and man? And that was Moses. So Moses intercedes in Psalm 90. And he really stands large, his shadow cast well, over all the Old Testament. But in book four of the Psalter, we hear a lot of themes from the Exodus, 
Uh, we have a lot of hope that God will bring about a new exodus. And so when you get to Psalms, it starts in really not Psalm 93 through 100 is a kind of segment here. And in those Psalms, we hear kind of a, a repeat of the Lord reigns. And then the next Psalm will be about, let's sing to the Lord. And then the Lord reigns. And then let's sing to the Lord. So you get this pattern in Psalm 93 through 100 that kind of alternates back and forth between God coming through on his promises. He still reigns. He's still the king. And God's people are to look to him. Um, he, the earthly temple, even though it might be destroyed, right? Churches might be um, closed. They might, you know, be torn down and everything. But yet God's heavenly kingdom is still there. And Christians have access to that, which we have through the blood of Christ. Psalm 100 then is kind of a doxology. Um, it's the jubilate, right? The uh, praise God. And so it kind of wraps up everything that the psalm has in book four have really gotten after. Um, and a beautiful psalm too. It's, it's short, really easy to commit to memory. Um, and it has some beloved themes of shepherd and sheep, as we'll soon see here in a moment. Yeah, that's right. Psalm, Psalm 100, even there's a, a hymn in our hymnal. I didn't look up the number, uh, all people that on earth do dwell. And it, the tune that's to the what we often call the common doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow, that tune is called Old Hundredth, because that yep. tune was composed, I believe, to go with the hymn for this psalm. So certainly a very memorable psalm that we have before us, a short one, well-suited, for the 100th birthday of KFUO, to be sure. So let's take a look. Here is the text of Psalm 100. A psalm for giving thanks. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. There's the text for today, Psalm 100. All right, so Pastor Belt, this psalm, along with many in the Psalter, begins with a, a superscription, which we don't necessarily count as part of verse 1 in the English Bible, but it is a part of verse 1 in the Hebrew. The superscription we have for Psalm 100 is this, a psalm for giving Thanks. Sometimes we skip over that. We're not going to do that today. That's right. <clears throat> you know, it's all valuable and good little tidbit information here that sets the context, right? The, what should we be seeing in this psalm, right? Psalm, where the word means praises, right? It's, it's songs, hymns, kind of that idea. Um, here, it's a psalm in particular for, for giving thanks. And the context here is kind of some thoughts about, you know, what does that exactly mean? Is it just an opportunity to give whenever the opportunity arises to give thanks? Certainly, that's true. And some commentators think maybe that this is in particular for the, the thank offering, that when you would offer up the thank offering to God, you would perhaps say this psalm. That's possible. Um, so while we don't have a concrete one, it's kind of applicable for any cir circumstances. Um, truly, it's kind of a, as a fitting word of doxology. We kind of get in the scriptures. Doxologies always tend to happen after some mystery of God has been revealed. So Paul, for example, in Romans chapters 9 through 11, right, he's, He's wrestling with Israel and what is God's election and all of this. And he ends where he doesn't really kind of, uh, he doesn't reach like what we would think is a, a conclusion that we're like, oh, okay, that all makes sense, right? He, he kind of let, just ends it and says, well, praise God, right? Uh, you know, who's ever been given God advice or who's ever given him a gift that he should be So doxology has always seemed to kind of come at the tail end of a, a mystery of God that he makes known. Here is the destruction of the earthly kingdom and the monarchy. And yet God reigns and he's going to come through on his promises. And he's, you know, as we would say, raise the sun. Um, and so it, it's here a fitting word of praise that God who can achieve all things um, and we leave it in his hands. That's right. So we have a psalm for giving thanks for all of those reasons. And the psalm for giving thanks starts with, I think, some very famous words in English. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. I know that that many of those who perhaps don't sing quite as well as some have really latched onto these words, and certainly <laughs> rightly so, but there's maybe more going on than just those who don't don't sing as well as others. Yeah. You know, uh, this word, this exact word, it's used a couple of times already in previous Psalms all leading up to this one. Um, but the probably the chief one that we would come to our heads and kind of wrap around what does this mean um, is that Zechariah 9.9 9 says this exact mm. word, shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. And why? Because your king is coming. And when you read Psalms 93 through 100, the whole point of it is that God reigns as king um, and he is coming to his people. And so shout aloud, we might think of it as, you know, the king enters, he's come in from battle, victory, 
And what do you do when the king comes triumphant? You shout, right? You praise God. There's a, almost like, it's almost like a military sound, mm. right? Uh, the battle's been won. The army now cheers. And that's kind of the, the shout aloud, the joyful noise of victory. And that's what's being described here. And, uh, and Psalm 100 is going to give us the shorthand of what the consequences of this victory. So the, the victory shout goes out, not just from the, the army, but it goes actually from all the earth. All the earth yeah. is called upon to, to participate in this victory shout. Yeah. You know, all the earth is bound to praise him, right? It, it, God's victory is uh, not just for a select group, right? But it's for all the creation. Mm. And so all the creation is going to join in praise. And, and several of the Psalms, we have that already with, uh, you know, the creation by doing what it does. What is it doing? It's, it's praising the creator. Um, and, you know, we would look out. Psalm 19 is kind of the par excellence of this Psalm that does this. Mm. The creation is doing its thing. And what it's doing is actually praising the creator. So when the sun does its motion, uh, when the, the wind is blowing, when the mountains are doing their thing, right? They're praising their creator. But we don't know what they're saying unless we are cued in by the word of God. The word of God must teach us what creation is saying and give voice to it. Um, and so here, right, we're, we're going to be like, well, what, what is this victory? And is that the God reigns? The Lord is ascended on high. Um, nothing's going to touch him. Nothing's going to undo this victory, right? The resurrection of Jesus Christ in our terms, right? That is for us. He has conquered death. Um, and so all the creation is going to join in because all the creation will be freed from bondage, you know, Romans 8, um, and then the concepts that are laid out that, there by Paul. Um, okay. So good things. Absolutely. So the, all the earth is going to praise the Lord, make this joyful noise to give this victory shout for the fact that he reigns over all creation. This includes then both, both people as God's creatures and the rest of the earth as God's creatures all together are called upon to join in this victory shout of joy to the Lord. We give thanks because the Lord reigns, and so the entire creation joins in this victory shout to him in verse 1. Then in verse 2, and I assume this is still addressed to all the earth is to participate in this. God's people and all creation are both called upon to serve the Lord with gladness, as well come into his presence with singing. Take us into both of those aspects. Yeah. You know, part of being uh, coming into God's presence is something that the priest does, right? And uh, we, who have been made priests by Christ, um, right? When we come into the presence of God, right? We it's kind of proleptic. We're bringing in the whole creation with us, right? We're the first fruits of His creatures. Um, and so, when we talk about all the earth being the priests, we bring in the cares. That's why right, when we bring the prayers of our church, right, during the prayers of the church. We'll pray for the needs of the world, right? Because we're bringing their needs and concerns before our God too. Um, so a beautiful thing. And so when we come into his presence, right, there's ideas of singing. And uh, as it says there, right, it's come into his presence, with, uh, serve the Lord with gladness and come into his presence. So serve and to come into the presence, they're put in parallel there in the Hebrew text. Um, the kind of uh, the, it highlights then what it's being meant then. To serve the Lord is to come into his presence. And which is a reminder, of course, that the divine service is called just that, right? Uh, God's service. Um, in the Hebrew mind, especially, worship and work were often intertwined uh, together. You know, we kind of separate them perhaps in our kind of secular worldview. Uh, but in the scriptures, right, your work was often seen as what God would do. You know, we as Lutherans, we say this is vocation, right? Uh, to come into his presence, to be faithful in our callings as to be priests of God. And, you know, he still had it, you know, the people when they worked in the fields or, um, when they went about their labors, they would sing, uh, sing hymns and things like that. A reminder that people often saw their work as an opportunity to praise their creator, uh, to meditate upon the word of God and, and all of these different facets in life as well. Mm, I really appreciate the connection to vocation there, that the serve the Lord with gladness and coming into his presence certainly happens in the divine service. And we would do well to recognize that, that when we come into the divine service, to serve the Lord, he ends up serving us with his gifts yeah. of joy so that we respond with praise and thanksgiving. But we don't leave his presence in the sense that he somehow abandons us. He, in fact, remains with us as we go forward into the world to serve our neighbor in love. And because we do so as those who have been served by him, then we continue to serve him with gladness and join our songs of praise to him, even to, to the work that we do. I'm reminded of the way Luther gives us the instructions in the small catechism after we prayed in the morning mm -hmm. to go about your work, 
singing a hymn, like one of the Ten Commandments. So this coming into the Lord's presence, joining our songs of praise to him happens certainly during the divine service on Sunday morning, but even throughout the week, which is just a, a wonderful thing. It is certainly. And, you know, the connecting kind of verse one and two together, then what we kind of have laid out here is the victory of the king enables us to well, live life, right? To thrive, uh, to, to be in peace, right? To, when you're in warfare, or times are tough, you know, work can be more, even more of a burden, but the victory of your king, there's no threats. You're secure. And so your work can be done with great joy. Yeah. And for we who are Christians who live with the victory of Jesus Christ and that being given to us, right? Yeah, what's death going to do, right? It, the Lord Jesus has overcome that. I can go about my work, my day, um, with the confidence that because the Lord Jesus Christ has risen and I have his victory and that love and the grace, right? D the day, life looks different because of that, because of Jesus. Yeah, just the, you know, the joyful noise, as it's translated in English, we're serving the Lord with gladness, we're singing in his presence. This is the, the joyful Christian life that can come about only in the security of knowing that the Lord is king, that he does in fact reign. And so our, our friends at the Lutheran Women's Missionary League, the LWML, who, who really latch on to this verse, serve the Lord with gladness, they are on to something there that all of us would do well to, to pick up in our own daily lives, that this is a, a daily thing for Christians, that we can live in the Lord's presence and serve him with joy. It's, it's very okay to smile as a Christian That's and right. to laugh and to be joyful. I think sometimes, sometimes we may forget that. Uh, you know, we're the Germans there. You got to get the stoic face going. So it's, it's good to smile in worship. It's good to smile as a Christian, to, to know the joy, to live in the joy that is ours because the Lord does reign as King. So this again, knowledge that the Lord is reigning that comes through then in verse three, know that the Lord is, he is God. Again, we've got these, you know, make a joyful noise, serve, come, now know. And given what we've talked about so far, it seems that the word know here has to mean more than have a certain set of facts in your head. All right. It's more than just, I know two plus two equals four. You know, it's, uh, um, and this is kind of really connects into covenant language with mm -hmm. God. Um, when you read uh, Jeremiah, um, especially the chapters 31 through 33 or uh, Hebrews 8 gets into this idea too, that knowing God, um, God has to make himself known and God does this in his acts of history. So the Exodus, um, Isaiah really picks up, you know, you should know that I am the Lord, your God. Um, and so when God acts, it causes his people to, to know him rightly. So not just as, you know, the demonic know him, like in the book of James, but actually to know him by faith, uh, know him by trust. Um, it's, it, Kind of in this sense, we can think back to this is what the commandments point us to, right? They can't give us it, but the commandments point us in this direction when they say it begins that I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall have no other gods and it goes into that. Um, what God's kind of getting at the commandments is know me, right? Here's who I am. And as a result, here's how you are, right? To know God is to live this way. Um, so the law points us in that. And of course, faith in Christ gives us that um, as, as we look at it. So this is covenant language, God accomplishing his salvation, our salvation for us. Um, and then when he delivers that to us, we now know him as our gracious Lord, the one who loves us and gave himself to us. I, I no longer see God as the, the cruel, angry taskmaster judge. Right? I see him as my deliverer, uh, the one who has saved me from the wrath to be revealed at the end. Uh, so to know God is to know him rightly by faith. And that's what verse three is trying to get at there, to know that the Lord, he is God, which is echoing that initial Exodus chapter 20 there with the Ten Commandments. Right? I am the Lord, your God. And here this is being said, know that the Lord, he is God. Mm -hmm. um, so it's turning our attention to his gracious acts in history, which is through Jesus Christ. Anytime we talk about knowing God, as Psalm 100 does here, I think it's important for us to to turn to say a verse like this in Galatians 4, where, where Paul uses this language and puts a, a spin on it that I think is helpful. This is Galatians 4, verse 9. He says, now that you have come to know God, mm. or rather to be known by God. So to, to know this God is first to have been known by him, which again is more than the Lord just saying, you know, 
I, I can pick him out of a crowd or something <laughs> like that. This is, or, you know, like go into the cheers bar, everybody knows your name. <laughs> this is more than that. This is the, again, that, that relationship knowledge that God knows us and, and has done something for us. And so I think anytime we talk about our knowledge of God and the, the commandments start like this in Exodus 20, we always have to start then with his knowledge of us and what he's done for us. Yeah, we're, as the psalm here we'll get into, we're his people, right? Uh, which echoes even further Exodus language, which captivates us and, and brings us in. You know, Jesus, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Um, so we see this, this rela- it's almost a relational term, not just a cognizant factoid kind of term. Yeah, which, I mean, again, is, is such a, an important thing for us as Christians when we think about the joy that we can have in this daily life to be known by God is is the source and the cause of that great joy that we have because it doesn't then depend on me and again all the facts that I know about God it's certainly good to know facts from the scriptures to know the word of God and have it in my in my mind but to first have been known by God to have been saved by God and and as you said to have been called his own that's what it ultimately means to be known by God the the flip side, of course, some of the, the more terrible words to hear from the Lord Jesus are the ones that he says, you know, I never knew you. Whoa. I mean, what a what a stark thing to have heard. On the opposite, this is the joy filled side. I do know you. I do love you. And I it very much I think connects to what the rest of verse three says. It's he who made us and we are his. Let's just pick up that that phrase, the fact that God yeah. made us and therefore we are his. Isn't that a beautiful language right there, right? It's uh I'm, you know, made by God, created by him, right? And I'm also redeemed by him, bought by him, right? So kind of, that kind of twofold work of God in the scriptures, his creation and his redemption, right? The, the two great works of God, as it's often called. And, uh, and so we see here that I'm his by right of him making me, right? And even more so, I'm his by his redemption work upon me, uh, that he's bought me bought me from all my sins, right? And as you know, as we quoted the small catechism, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. Um, that's the kind of knowing we're talking about here, not just, uh, oh, I'll spring you out. What, I got pocket change here. Is this enough? It, I give myself. Uh, God makes himself known when he gives himself to us. And uh, that causes us to be owned by him and he is ours and we are his. And, and what a delightful relation then that we have with our God um, who freely gives of himself with, uh, for us and for our sake, um, yeah, beautiful language. And, uh, and that kind of echoes even, like we said earlier, in the book of Exodus, right? Uh, I, I will be your God and, and you shall be my people. And this kind of echoes then the, the language of Exodus, which as I kind of said earlier at the beginning, Psalms 90 through 106 echo a lot of Moses's words and the, and the, the Torah and, and all of that. So we're kind of picking up on a lot of themes in Psalm 100. If you're kind of paying careful attention, you'll Oh, this word kind of connects to ideas and other images um, as we kind of bounce around the scriptures now, as we've already been doing. Yeah, that's right. And it's, it's the joy of reading the Psalter and indeed the entire scriptures as we continue to let the Lord sharpen our faith in him here on Sharper Iron through the words of Psalm 100. We're going to pick up more of this psalm after we come back from a break here on KFUO to share Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. We are looking at Psalm 100 today on this first day of share We've got Pastor Andrew Belt with us. He is the pastor at Christ Lutheran Church in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Pastor Belt, prior to our break, we were in the middle of verse 3, where there is just so much good stuff. We're talking about the, the phrase, it is he who made us and we are his. And you pointed us to the, the dual action of God 
both in creation and redemption. And as you were talking about that, I was thinking about the way that the Lord speaks about his Sabbath day in the commandments. And, and both of those, when you look at the commandments listed in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, the fact that the Lord is the creator and the fact that the Lord is the redeemer are the reasons that you observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Uh, both of those are a reminder that when it comes to your creation and your redemption, you didn't work. You simply rested mm -hmm. while the Lord was at work for you. And so you're free to take this day off. And it really, that that restful joy of the Sabbath then, as we were saying, pervades into all of our lives as Christians, because we know even as we go about our daily tasks, it is the Lord who is at work and and the one who's, who's at work in us. And so that we can sleep at peace at night because he's the one who's working. And so we have that joy to know that we're his, he's the one who's created us, he's the one who's redeemed us, and we can simply live as his His people in the joy that he gives. You know, something that kind of, I forget where, I just recently read this, uh, so somewhere, um, but the fact of how the, you know, the Hebrew mind thought of the day even kind of applies to this, right? So it's, uh, the day begins in the evening, and then when you time you wake up in the morning, the day is already kind of, you know, halfway through, because then it ends at the next sundown. And so we we think we wake up in our morning and say, okay, God, I need help to do this, this, and this, and this. But when we think about the idea that the day has begun with us going to bed and resting, when I wake up in the morning, God has already been at work doing his thing. And so instead of him asking, hey, help me to do my stuff, I then say, hey, how can I help you accomplish what needs to get done in the creation today? Um, and so I join with God and doing his task and it's, instead of the other way around, like where it's about me and now, God, you have to serve me and help me get my stuff done. Um, I'm joining in God and he's already given me the rest. He's like, take it easy the half first half of the day. I got it. Um, so we kind of live lives like that. And that kind of shapes that, too. Um, so a beautiful way to think about that. So thinking about the action of the Lord in that case, uh, maybe it's it's worth just a brief comment on the ESV footnote that goes with mm. this section of the verse. Again, the, the text reads, it is he who made us and we are his. The footnote suggests that a, another way you could translate that last phrase is, and not we ourselves. So it is he who made us yeah. and not we ourselves, highlighting, I think, some of the thoughts that you were just bringing up. Right. And, you know, when you think about it like that, if you take it, you know, he is he who made us and not we ourselves. Right. I am not the, the I'm not the one who makes me. I'm not a self-made man. Right. Uh, and that's kind of maybe a popular idea out there. I get to, to choose uh, this or that about myself. But if I think about how God has created me, I think about my vocations, too. Right. I didn't get to choose to be born. I didn't sit with my mom and dad say, OK, here's how I want this to go, guys. Um I also didn't get to choose my male or female, right? God created me as man. Um, I also didn't get to choose if I got a brother. Uh, I didn't get to, you know, I had to be put into marriage. God, you know, I had to be placed, ordained into the office of the ministry. All right, so as I look at my vocations, I don't get to choose. It's just given to me. And therefore, there's already work to do in those things, right? There's a lot of tasks for me as a father and as a husband and as a pastor and as a man and a Christian and a neighbor you know, here's your vocations that right? you start thinking through. Um, and in fact, Luther kind of takes it this way too. If, uh, his commentary on Genesis, he quotes Psalm 100 and he takes the he, he takes the, the verse in this way that not we ourselves. I love this quote here. I have to read it. The Lord has made us and not we ourselves. Why does the Holy Spirit put uh, us in the mind of this as though no one actually knew it? Truly, the entire world has need of this teaching. For all who are presumptuous about their works do not know that they are made by the Lord, and they need to be reminded that they were made by the Lord. Otherwise, they would be humble themselves before their Creator and would not be presumptuous about their own powers, because whatever they have, they have from God. Mm -hmm. And a beautiful way to kind of stop and think about that, right? That He is the source of all of it. He is the source of my life, even. Um, it's not me. I don't have to try to keep this going. It's the Lord who graciously gives to me. As Psalm 100 verse 3 continues then, we confess that we are his people. So that really connects to what's just happened. The Lord has created us not for no purpose, but in order to be his, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom, we confess in the catechism. So we are his yeah. people. And that means that we are also the sheep of his pasture. So we've got, again, such rich language here. We've got the covenant thought that God is our God and we are his people. And then we've got this beautiful scriptural theme that we've got, we are the sheep and we have a good shepherd. So have at it, Pastor Belt. 
Oh, there's a ton here that we can get into. Uh, this is almost a, a very direct quote from what we've already heard in Psalm 95 in this section. So Psalm 100 is kind of bringing that idea back into the forefront of our minds as the kind of the central praise unit here, um, that we're his people, which brings to mind the covenant that because of God's promises to us, we are now his people. Um, and he is also our God. Um, and, and so we have this God related us properly again. We belong to him and he belongs to us. Um, and not just because he created us, but because he's worked out our salvation. Um, I've been bought with a price, as we would say. And of course, we could take that, you know, if you're in the three-year lectionary, the Good Shepherd Sunday is coming up this week. I'm, I'm in the one-year lectionary. We just got oh, done with it this you're past ahead week. Of us. I know, right? <laughs> um, so, but the same themes can be applied. So we're kind of in good, we could say that this is Good Shepherd Week, bracketed before and after, right? Um, so we can look at other places in Scripture. This is such a common theme. Um, shepherds in the Bible, right? Moses was a shepherd. King David par excellence in the Old Testament, right? Uh, Ezekiel 34, God says that he will be the shepherd of his sheep. And of course, in the ancient world, a shepherd was also a code word for king, right? Because the shepherd is the one who leads the people. Um, and so God's going to shepherd his people. He's going to find them out. Ezekiel 34 is all about that, uh, that God, he's not going to have someone else do it. He himself is going to do this for his sheep. Um, and he's going to rescue them. You know, we get to the Psalm 23, that, you know, probably the most famous psalm in the entire Psalter there, Psalm 23, that people just love, and for good reason, right? The Lord, he is my shepherd, um, and he leads me into green pastures. And we want to connect this with Psalm 100. The pastures that God leads us to is his sanctuary, his, uh, his place of abode, right, where God dwells. Um, you know, it's a uh, when we come to the divine service, right, we should perhaps bring, you know, that Sherathon bell we just rang, right? It's the dinner bell. Right. Uh, and so the sheep are here to be fed and cared for. Um, and so God's going to feed them with good pasture. This past uh, week, when we came to the service of the sacrament, when it came time for the people to come up, I said, the Lord is here to feed us with his good pasture today. Right. Mm -hmm. Come to the table of your Lord. Uh, and so the sheep come up to be fed. Right. They even file up single file. It's, it's beautiful that way. Right. Uh, and so here we have a beautiful imagery that's set across that we can see across the entire scriptures uh, that God is our shepherd. Um, that he's going to one that takes care of his sheep. He's going to find them. He's going to bring them in. They've been scattered, which has been happened in book three. The people have been scattered, but they're going to bring together. We see this in the work of Jesus. I will strike the shepherd. The sheep will be scattered. But after, right, after I've been raised up, I'll go before you. And what do the sheep do? They follow him. Um, and so it's kind of this is the after the resurrection, right? He keeps kind of calling his sheep by name and he leads them out, right? So we, we have this whole theme being kind of given up to us in the scriptures of a good shepherd who takes care of us, um, who's paid for our sins, and all is right in the world. With the, the theme of the Good Shepherd in the Scriptures, there's so many different directions we could take this, as you said. Perhaps for our conversation today, let's, let's think about the joy that's involved in the being the sheep of the shepherd. And maybe, uh, here's, here's a thought, the, think about first the joy of the shepherd himself. So uh, it's Luke 15, the parable of the, the shepherd who goes and gets the lost sheep, he has the joy to go do that. And then that joy spreads into his flock as, as together, then they rejoice. And I think maybe, you know, we, I think of the good shepherd, the first maybe adjective that comes to mind is comforting, but the joyful yeah. nature of being the, the sheep of the shepherd comes through, especially in Psalm 100. Yeah. You know, I think of, uh, when you think of joy as kind of infectious that way, Right. Uh, it, it, you know, they always kind of say, if you start smiling, other people start smiling. Well, when God's salvation is made known, it can't help but create joy in us. Um, it, it's one of the fruits of the spirit, right? That joy. And so joy is a gift that God gives. If you want to think of it in terms of what our psalmist said, it's not just something that I create, right? To try to strain to kind of create a smile on my face or joy. Joy is rather a gift that God has given to me. And why? Because he has achieved my salvation that Things are now right between God and man. Uh, and now also because of that between me and my brother too, my, my fellow sheep who has been rescued and delivered too, right? We can now have this joy with one another. And in the parable of the, the shepherd there in Luke 15, right? This joy is because someone who was lost has been found, right? He's been brought back. And so, right, what can there be a better response to when someone hears the gospel? Maybe they've been away for a while and come back, right? The sheep should rejoice because the angel's in heaven rejoice over this fact too that one who has been lost is found uh death has been brought forth into life 
um, grace has been given uh, and grace has been received and with great joy. Yeah, and, and even in, in all of that, you see the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the joy that was yeah. set before him, he endured the cross. So it is with joy that the Lord Jesus, our good shepherd, lays down his life, takes it back up again for our sakes, so that he would be the good shepherd, the one that we need, the one who does everything for our salvation, and we can have the joy of being his sheep, not only just me and Jesus, he's my shepherd, but he is our good shepherd. He has his whole yeah. flock and what a joy it is to belong to him and to belong to that whole flock, his church. We are now at verse four of this beautiful Psalm. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. The, the talk of entering into the gates, the courts, probably we're thinking the, the temple here. Yeah. You know, and actually something that came to mind here too, the gates, you know, Jesus says, I am the gate yes. of the sheep. I thought the and same that, thing, actually. Yeah, yes. It, it, you know, you get brought in. And so Jesus is the way by which we enter, right? He's the way, the truth, and the life. So we enter by him. Uh, and this is how we have access to God, right? It, Jesus is our high priest. Um, some of the thoughts here that get brought up in here too is uh, entering into his courts, being into God's presence, it brings to mind the temple. Which is, you know, as we translate that into New Testament, where is the temple? It is the the church. It's the body of the believers, right? It's the um, we're being made into living stones, precious, right, um, in His sight. And so, to enter into His gates is to be a part of His people, as you kind of put it right before the break, right? It's this psalm. While we might say, I might say, this psalm prayed individually, it brings me into the corporate life of the church, just like how the Lord's prayer begins, not just by saying "My Father," but "Our Father who art in heaven." And so here, I'm connected to the larger piece, uh, the larger whole, as it were, the church uh, in its totality here. Uh, so to enter into it with thanksgiving, right? Uh, it, it's, it brings to mind, of course, too, that being brought in, Christ has brought us in. And how do we see that New Testament? By his death, what happens to the curtain in the temple? It's torn, right? Now God's presence, there's access to him. So talk about joy that I'm his. Even more so now, but it, to further define that, how am I his? Because he's brought me in all the way um, through Christ. This is given to me now by faith. It's totally mine, totally ours um, together. Uh, and so it's, you know, talk about joy upon joy here, that the, ch the gift of the church, right? The church is not our doing, right? It, I, I'm in the church, you know, and as pastors, right, we work in the church and all of that stuff, but it's not kept up by our work, right? Our, my work or your work, right? It's done by the Lord, right? It's, it's his and he gives it to us by gift. He shares that reality with us and it's ours. Um, but what a joy that is then that I'm a part of something that's greater than me. Um, and it's going to out, outlast anything else I could ever do. And it's a gift that Jesus gives to me for all eternity. And so I get to enter into his presence, his gates, his courts, um, I get to stand in the presence of God. You know, you can hear, uh, you know, Revelation 7 in the background right there in his presence. He wipes away their tears. There's no more death. Uh, the, um, there's no hunger nor thirst because the one who sits on the throne will be their shepherd. Um, and so here we see the scriptures are kind of using this idea of what eternal life and eternal joy are, the presence of God. Yeah, I appreciate the connection to Revelation there, because that is what makes this such a joyful place, is this is where we are with the Lord, who is our shepherd. That's what makes it the joyful place. That's why we come into those gates and that court with this praise and thanksgiving. We've talked about the thanksgiving from the outset. Part of the thanksgiving in verse 4 is that we would bless his name. Talk about that way of speaking in yeah. the scriptures. Yeah. So when you think of a give thanks and bless, uh, these are words that we we still use in our communion liturgy, right? Let us give thanks to the Lord. Um, and the night when Jesus was betrayed, he gave thanks, um, broke the bread, you know, and gave it. And then we have the, the word bless in our communion liturgy. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, right? Uh, and so when we partner in this language, we bring it together, we realize that, uh, um, that God is giving gifts in a response to him with his gifts. Um, is praise and blessing. So, you know, and oftentimes you'll see this in the Bible to bless God, to bless his name, mm -hmm. right? We don't ask for like a particular thing. We ask for God's name to be blessed. Um, so it's kind of the whole enchilada, um, as it were. And, and so this kind of brings us to mind and it really brings to mind that, that idea of Eucharist, giving thanks. Um, and here that's used in this language in the Psalms as well. So why, you know, as opposed to say, bless the Lord, O my soul, Psalm 103 coming up here in the Psalter, here it's bless his name particularly. Yeah. Why the name of God? 
Well, you know, something that's kind of interesting that when you talk about God's name, God's name is how he reveals himself. It, it's the word that makes God known. As we would say, know that the Lord, he is God. How does God do this? Through the proclamation of the word. Um, that's how we know. And, and so God's name is often tied to his person. It, 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 it is him, right? We would think of it just a name, right? I say Tim or, or Andrew or whatever, right? That it's not just a sound that we say, but there's meaning, there's identity, there's uh, people's works come behind it, their reputation, their standing. And so to bless God's name kind of envelops all of that, right? We, we bring the totality of God to bear when we speak his name or Numbers chapter six, right? The Aaronic benediction, right? Uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. At the end of that, God says, so I will put my name on the people and I will bless them. Uh, so almost speaking God's name to bless his name, then also carries that blessing, which then flows down to all of us. Or as we would say in the doxology, right? Praise God from whom all blessings flow as it goes down from heaven to, uh, to earth. Um, and we see that language in the scriptures all over the place as well. Yeah, I and mean, you can think about the way the name of God just permeates the worship service. It starts that way. We invoke his name at the beginning. We close with his name in the benediction, all of which yeah. then recalls uh, the baptism into Christ in which God's name has been placed upon us for our blessing. And so we bless his name. We speak the things that he has done and praise him for those things as a part of those those gifts that he has given to us. I, I can't help but think of, in addition, the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name. And the way then that as we pray that, God answers that prayer by placing his name upon us, by making his name holy for us. And again, our Father, this is a prayer that we are praying together as a church, and he's answering that prayer for us in the context of the worship service, which then, of course, as we've said, permeates our whole lives. But then we we come back to the dying service every week to continue to receive these gifts, to be there in the Lord's presence, to have the blessing of his name upon us. Our psalm concludes then with words that are very familiar to the Psalter and to our lives as Christians. Verse 5 says this, For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. The Lord is good, yeah. Pastor Bell. Talk about that. Yeah, good. That word, you know, this perhaps would bring us then directly to mind to when we get to John 10, when yeah. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Um, I'm sure some of the readers are like, oh, is that like Psalm 100? All right. That, and it should be a word that kind of comes up to us then. The Lord is good. Um, so we, you know, not just an idea, and this is actually kind of the topic I preached last week in my Good Shepherd Sunday, and not the idea that he's just morally good, but the idea of good being kind of more the aesthetic appeal, beauty, goodness, that thing that draws us in, another one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? Goodness. Um, you know, the creation, when God created, what do you say at the end of each day? It is good, right? It's um, So the Lord draws us in, right? His word, and that's why Jesus, when he speaks the word, the sheep will know him and they'll be drawn to him. All right. So what's going to draw people in? It's going to be the gospel, right? Your sins are forgiven, right? It is all good. Jesus has paid for it all um, that you are now made pleasing. You made now good to God. And so this is not just an, an admonition of an abstract thought. This is actually a gift that God is giving, right? The Lord is good uh, and his goodness then is given to us. And that's why we now know him. So, you know, this is connecting a lot of thoughts and imagery. And then the final, those, the last key words there, the steadfast love endures forever. One, the word steadfast love, we could just have an entire hour long Bible study yeah. on that word. That occurs dozens of times in the Psalter and then throughout the whole Old Testament. In fact, that's kind of the, the gospel word there. We don't know exactly how to translate it. There, there's so many different words. Psalm 23 translates the word steadfast love as the mercy, right? Surely goodness and mercy. So that kind of connects us back to Psalm 23, too, with those two words. Um, but it also means covenant love, right? Uh, unfailing love. God will not drop you, right? He's got gotcha. you. Um, this is gospel language here. And then the final word, the faithfulness there. Um, when you read Psalm 88 and 89, Psalm 89 in particular, pairs the word steadfast love and faithfulness seven times. And this is kind of remarkable, Bill, because at the, at the end, Psalm 89 wonders and says, is God's steadfast love and faithfulness, is it going to last? Is it true, right? Is it over, right? And so Psalm 89 kind of leaves us almost like a eulogy that, oh, here's what God had promised, but it looks like it's over now. Oh, no, you know, what do we do? Psalm 100 says, oh, no, no, right? It is still on. It is good. Um, you know, the death of Jesus, perhaps, you know, you're like, oh, no, is it over now? That's what the, mm -hmm. the 
disciples on the road to Emmaus. We had hoped that he was the one, right? right? But here, the resurrection, Jesus, oh no, you guys are slow of heart to believe. Here's what God has spoken, right? The steadfast love and the faithfulness, they're on, they're good. They will endure forever, and it's for all people, um, as we would say. So thanks be to God. Yeah, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Why? His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. The Lord will not go back on his promise. He will keep his promise. The death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ have sealed that for us so that we can have the joy that is so evident here in Psalm 100. Pastor Belt, with just about a minute left, Hmm. help us to see that joy for our lives as Christians every day. Man, Jesus is for you every single day, right? His mercy is new every morning. Uh, Great is his faithfulness towards us, right? He will always be faithful. God will never back down on promises that he has spoken to us through his word. And for that, you know, give thanks for Sharper Iron, for KFUO, and for all of that as we, you know, broadcast that and tell the world, you know, I've had members of my congregation here who have heard that word and have rejoiced because of that as well. Um, and have loved the the Bible studies and everything done here. So thanks be to God indeed as that work is proclaimed in our midst and and the love of Jesus Christ is given to us. So what what a joy it is. Pastor Andrew Belt serves at Christ Lutheran Church in Marshfield, Wisconsin. He has helped us today to take a look at Psalm 100. Pastor Belt, thank you for sharing the joy of Jesus with us this morning. It's been an honor. Thank you. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. We will be back tomorrow with another 100-themed episode for Sharper Iron as we continue to celebrate the 100th birthday of KFUO. Thanks for spending the morning with us. We're going to hand it back over to those in the studio. Talk to you again tomorrow.